Are you so happy? See what I did. Be my only. Be so happy. See what I did. Be my only. Be my only. Be my only. I Please be seated. Afternoon. Can you believe we're at the end? It seems like time just flew by, didn't it? Yes. 
So I wanted to give my last presentation on a topic that has come to me often. I've had a few people here and even back home ask me this question and it's it's really a sign that the enemy is trying to discourage us in these last days. I've had the question come to me, how do I know if I have grieved the Spirit of God? Or have I grieved the Spirit of God? Is there just no hope for me? So in this message, I want to show you the difference between two characters in the Bible, the first being Judas and the second being Peter. I want us to remember something very clearly. God is always faithful. We are not. Right? We're the unfaithful, unfaithful ones, but God, he's always faithful. How many of us have made a promise that we couldn't keep or haven't kept? Right? I want us to take a look at a promise that was made by the disciples. And in this promise, I want to focus on these two characters, Judas and Peter. In Mark chapter 14, we're going to read verse 27 to 31. Mark chapter 14, verse 27 to 31. Verse 27 says, And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow tw thrice, or twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. And notice this. Likewise also said they all. Now, if you read the New King James Version, where it says, all you shall be made to fall. The translation there is stumble. Right? Jesus was warning them that this very night, their foundation was going to be shaken. Who was their foundation? Christ. Right? He said that they would be shaken. But let me ask you this. If the foundation is shaken, is there a chance at recovery? If you're stumbling, can you stop yourself from falling? Who can do that? Who can stop you from falling? Christ. It is our goal to keep our eyes fixed on Christ. If we keep our eyes fixed on Christ, we may stumble, but not fall, right? In the mind of the disciples, Jesus was on a roll until he said this. Until he told them their future, they were like, yeah, yeah, we are followers, aren't we? But as soon as he predicted what would happen to them, they were, they were vehement. 
Peter, the roar. Man, if anybody's going to hold you down, it's going to be me. Right? So let's take a look to see who was the first to go back on this oath. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 14 to 16, this is right after Judas and the others got uneasy about the woman who came and anointed Jesus' feet. Verse 14 says, Then one of the twelve, called who? Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. Let's stop there. What was valued at 30 pieces of silver? Say it again. Slaves. 30 pieces of silver was the price of a slave. And Judas, the one who walked with Christ daily, sold him for the price of a slave. Verse 16, and from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Jumping over now to Matthew chapter uh, 27, verse 1 to 4. When the morning was come, reading at verse 1, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. Now notice this. In the betrayal of Judas, it said he repented himself. What does that mean? Say it again. It was, he was sorrowful for what he had done. But let me ask you this. Was he sorrowful? Was he truly sorrowful for what he had done? Or was he sorrowful for the consequences? He was sorrowful for the consequences. The repentance of Judas was not true repentance. Notice. When one sins, sin brings guilt, and guilt brings shame. And guilt and shame should lead to repentance. True repentance. This is where we see the guilt of Judas. And let me tell you this, everyone who has asked me the question regarding the unpardonable sin, it's because they feel guilty. They feel this overwhelming sense of guilt and shame because of their sins. And in their mind, there's no way they can be forgiven. Let's continue. All right. It says this, verse 3 and 4. When Judas saw that he was condemned, He repented of himself.
How many of us know of the story of the woman caught in adultery? Right? Let's go there real quick. In John chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. John chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. When Jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, ver those thine accusers. Has no man condemned thee? She said, what? No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Here, what do we see as a quality of Christ? Forgiveness. Right? We see that Christ is willing to forgive. Notice, he didn't ask her, hey, woman, how many times have you done this? He, he didn't ask her that, did he? In fact, he didn't even talk to the woman about her sins at all. The only thing Jesus did was forgive her, look her in the eye, and said, go and sin no more. Now, someone read Romans 8, verse 1 for me. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says what? Amen. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It pains me. When I hear Christians ask me, hey, look, am I condemned? He who hath breath, let him do what? Praise the Lord. Right? There's hope. Because we have a sin-pardoning Savior. Right? Right? Now, for Judas to come to this realization of condemnation was to admit that he was not in Christ and walking according to the Spirit. Judas walked with Christ day by day and found himself outside of Christ. There are very key things in our life that will show us whether we've committed that sin or not. Number one, you won't feel truly guilty about it. And that guilt will not bring true repentance. Next thing we see is in Matthew chapter 27, verse 3, where it says he repented, of, of, repented himself, right? No true sorrow was here. Because we know what Judas did later. Jesus or Judas felt sorry for himself, not for Christ. Right? In the book, Conflict and Courage, listen to what the author says here. I'm in page 285, paragraph 5. Yeah, 285, I'm sorry, paragraph 3 to 4. This is what it says. It says, the disciples were anxious that Judas should become one of their number. He was of commanding appearance, a man of keen discernment, an executive ability, and they commended him to Jesus as one who would greatly assist him in his work. The after history of Judas would show them the danger of allowing any worldly consideration 
to have weight in deciding the fitness of men for the work of God. Yet when Judas joined the disciples, he was not insensible to the beauty of the character of Christ. He felt the influence of that divine power which was drawing souls to the Savior. The Savior read the heart of Judas. He knew the depths of iniquity to which unless delivered by the grace of God, Judas would sink. So according to my study of the word of God, there's a difference between just sin and iniquity. Sin is the transgression of the law. However, iniquity is a relationship with sin. Jesus knew the heart of Judas. And instead of casting him off, what do you think Jesus did? He pulled him closer. He did everything he could to try to save Judas. Right? In, connection, in connecting this man with himself, he placed him where he might day by day be brought in contact with the over outflowing of his own unselfish love. If he would open his heart to Christ, divine grace would banish the demon of selfishness. And even Judas might become a subject of the kingdom. Do you think that Christ is trying to make sure that no one gets into heaven? No. No. In fact, it's quite the extreme opposite. God did everything possible to get us there. Page 286, paragraph 2 says this, How tenderly the Savior dealt with him who was to be his betrayer. In his teaching, Jesus dwelt upon the principles of benevolence that struck at the very root of covetousness. He presented before Judas the heinous character of greed. And many a time the disciple realized that his character had been portrayed and his sin pointed out, but he would not confess and forsake his unrighteousness. He was self-sufficient. And instead of resisting temptation, he continued to follow his fraudulent practices. Jesus dealt with him, dealt him no sharp rebuke for his covetousness, but with divine patience, bore with this erring man, even while giving him evidence that he read his heart as an open book. He presented before him the highest incentives for right doing. And in rejecting the light of heaven, Judas was without excuse. Understand this, if you are hearing the voice of God, there is time to repent. Could Judas have changed his course? Absolutely. Absolutely. There would have been no reason for Jesus to continue to petition to the heart of Judas if his heart was unchangeable. If he did not have the option to turn back. Judas was without question found guilty. He was so close to the Savior, yet misunderstood his love. This led to almost indescribable confusion and an overwhelming burden of guilt. And because of this, verse 5 of Matthew chapter 27 says this, and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple 
and departed and went and hanged himself. Now, if before you say to yourself, man, if, if guilt took him that far, what about me? Guilt can also be a good thing, right? Depending on what you do with it. Mark chapter 14, verse 29. Mark chapter 14 and verse 29. Now, keep that there. Luke chapter 22. I'm going to read verse 31 and 32. Right? Paying attention to Mark chapter 14 verse 29. This is what Luke chapter 22 verse 31 says. And the Lord said... Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Right? Mark chapter 14, verse 29 says, But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet not will I. Luke chapter 22, verse 32 says that Peter wasn't even converted. Jesus says, But when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. He's sitting here trying to make this promise to Christ and he's not even converted. This was right before Peter made his vehement oath, right? And oh, how plainly the fact that Peter was not truly converted yet was shown in the word of God. Mark chapter 14, verse 66 to 72. And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth? And what did Peter do? But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and what happened? And the cock crew. And a maid saw him again, and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he did what? He denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeth there, thereto. But he began to curse and swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. Did cursing and swearing show that Peter's heart was converted? Did his denial of Christ show that he was converted? Let's go back to the book Conflict and Courage where the pen of inspiration says this regarding Peter. In page 313, paragraph 2, Behold, aggressive and self-confident, quick to perceive and forward to act. Prompt in retaliation, yet 
generous and forgiving. Peter often erred and often received reproof. Nor were his warm-hearted loyalty and devotion to Christ the less decidedly recognized and commended. Patiently, with discriminating love, the Savior dealt with his impetuous disciple, seeking to check his self-confidence and to teach him humility, obedience, and trust. But only in part was this was the lesson learned. Over and over again was given the warning, Thou shalt deny that thou knowest me. It was the grieved, loving heart of the disciple that spoke out in the avowal, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. When in the judgment hall, the words of denial had been spoken, when Peter's love and loyalty awakened under the Savior's glance of pity and love and sorrow had sent him forth to the garden where Christ had wept and prayed, when his tears of remorse dropped upon the saw that had been moistened with the blood drops of his agony. Then the Savior's words, I have prayed for thee, were a stay to his soul. Christ, though foreseeing his sin, had not abandoned him to despair. Do you think that Christ was a respecter of persons when it came to Peter? Christ knew the heart of both Judas and Peter and were drawing both of them. Both of them were under the pangs of guilt. But only one of them perceived Christ. Truly. Right? Judas and Peter were different, but the same in many ways. They had equal time with the Savior. Both were flawed unbeknownst to themselves, and both had a choice where their burden of guilt would take them. Many times we bind up the hands of Christ in our life. How many times have we gone to God in prayer? With that hint of unbelief? Because of that sin you committed? Even though you've already made your confession, there's a guilt trip, right? It's the promise of God that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The disciples saw that in the dealing with the woman caught in adultery. But that burden of guilt took one Judas to a different course than Peter. God is faithful, we're not. In Micah chapter 7, verse 18 and 19. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He reigneth not his anger forever. He retaineth not his anger forever, but he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. What an analogy here. You do know that if you dive in the sea to a certain depth, 
the pressure gets intense, right? And it begins to weigh heavily upon you until you're crushed by its weight. If God is throwing your sins in the depths of the sea, I submit to you, brothers and sisters, don't go and try to fish them out. Leave it there. Trust him. He has given us the promise. If you feel guilty about what you have done, guilt is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's a real good thing. As long as that guilt leads you to Christ. In Psalms chapter 51, David felt the enormous weight of guilt, didn't he? By saying, my sin is ever before me. But it was in that same psalm that he asks. No, he begs. He begs for the cleansing. Not only from the sin but the guilt it leaves behind. Now, let me ask you, can God accomplish that? Yeah. Without a doubt. Is there anything too hard for God? No. In the same book, Conflict and Courage, page 313, paragraph 4. Notice this, it is not God's goal, nor the Son of God, to condemn. If the look that Jesus cast upon him, speaking of Peter, had spoken condemnation instead of pity, if in foretelling the sin he had failed of speaking hope, how dense would have been the darkness that encompassed Peter? But here's the thing. When we're not looking at Christ in the right light, guilt or that look can seem like a glare. You have Judas on one side, Peter on the other. Peter's sin, just like ours, wounds the heart of the Savior. Going to page 286 of the same book, paragraph 2, 4. You know, before I read that, I want to remind you of something. The pen of inspiration tells us that at the fall of Lucifer, there was a time when Lucifer felt guilty, right? And he almost repented. Let me ask you this. If Lucifer would have repented, would there have been a pardoning of sin for Lucifer? Absolutely. We serve a God of love. Notice what this says. Satan is playing the game of life for every soul. He knows that practical sympathy is a test of the purity and unselfishness of the heart. And he will make every possible effort to close our hearts to the needs of others. He will bring in many things to pervert the expression of love and sympathy. It is thus that he ruined Judas. Judas was constantly planning to benefit self. In this, he represents a large class of professed 
Christians of today. Therefore, we need to study his case. We are as near to Christ as he was. Yet, if, as with Judas, association with Christ does not make us one with him, if it does not cultivate within our hearts a sincere sympathy for those whom Christ gave his life, we are in the same danger as was Judas. Testimonies for the churches. Actually, no, let's continue. It says, we need to guard against the first deviation from righteousness. For one transgression, one neglect to manifest that spirit of Christ opens the way for another and still another, until the mind is overmastered by the principles of the enemy. If cultivated, the spirit of selfishness becomes a devouring passion, which nothing but the power of Christ can subdue. Now, think about this. On one side, you have Judas. On the other side, you have Peter. Here's the things that we know. Christ didn't love them any differently, did he? No. They were both sinners in need of a Savior, weren't they? They both experienced the guilt of betraying the Savior. However, this is where they differ. In one, the guilt took him to the cross, to Christ. In the other, guilt was so consumed in self that he took the life that Christ paid for. Now, let me tell you this. Before you ask the question, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Ask yourself, it's, is there breath in your lungs? We have a sin-pardoning Savior. It is written, He does not delight in the death of the wicked. He does not want to see death come upon any of us. So know this. If you have breath, there's hope. There is hope. Today, while it is called today, what? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Our loving Father and our God in heaven, Lord, we are thankful. We are grateful for the mercy that is extended toward us. It is undeserved. But your magnificent love for us causes you to continually extend it toward us. No matter how far we've gone, your hand is stretched out still. Father, it is our desire to feel the warm embrace of the promises found in your word. Father, I pray that you would help us to not despair over our sins, but to place them at the feet of Jesus. And to repent, truly repent of our sins and iniquities, 
and walk in the path of righteousness. Father, we know this, that if we follow in the footsteps of our Savior, we cannot err. Father, I pray that love be made manifest in us. It is our desire for Christ to live in our hearts, not only to live in us, but through us, so that others may know that we have been with the Lord. Let us not deny you in word or in deed, but let us uplift the crucified Savior. Let us make known to the world that there is a sin-pardoning Savior. Father, if we have sinned against you, I pray that this day our sins be thrown in the depths of the sea. Thank you, O oh God, for the things that you have done and what you will continue to do in our lives because we know that you are faithful and we are the ones that walk away from you. Keep us in your way, O oh God, in Jesus' name, amen.